Well, the Big Ten this year looks to be the most exciting season I can ever remember being a Big Ten fan. We got we got four new teams. We got 18 now, and we're very excited. Will one of the traditional teams win it all, or one of the newbies win it all? We're going to talk about that coming up next. This is the 2024 Locked On College Football Season Preview, only on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to the 2024 Locked On College Football Season Preview, the Big Ten edition. I'm Craig Sheeman from Locked On Big Ten, and we're going to hear from several of our local Locked On experts from around the conference here. I'm very excited about this show. And as you know, we have several Big Ten teams, uh, not only in the conference as we grow, but several that have chances to get into the college football playoffs. And we'll kind of boil it down to see who's going to win the championship at the end of the season as well. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app and create an account and use the code LOCKDOWN for $20 off your first purchase. We are joined by J- uh, Jay Stevens from Lockdown Buckeyes, Isaiah Hole from Lockdown Wolverines, and Zach Seiko from Lockdown Nittany Lions. Gentlemen, it's great to have you all on here. I want to start you all off because – each one of you has an interesting quarterback situation I want to talk about going into the season before we predict how this whole thing is going to unfold. Jay, we'll start with you. You got Will Howard, a quarterback room of uh, five really good quarterbacks there at Ohio State. Two of them are five-star freshmen that are getting after it. I can't help but wonder, is Will Howard going to be the starter at the end of the season, or are we waiting for Julian Sayan to warm up and take over this program midway through? What do you think? I think that's to be determined. I think for Will Howard to be the starting quarterback all year long, his experience has to really reign true and really show that he has earned that still. But he has to be more accurate. If Will Howard shows he can be more accurate and can throw the deep ball and can make all the throws, I do think he will be the starter all year. Julian Sand and Devin Brown are right behind him. But I think Howard's a front runner right now, and it's really his job to lose. Uh, Devin Brown, tough deal. Two years in a row, he gets edged out by two different guys. So I, I wonder what his future will be after this year. His future is one where he's he's committed to wanting to be a Buckeye starting quarterback at some point in time. Back-to-back years, he's lost the quarterback battle once to McCord this year to Will Howard. My gut says he'll stick around to start next year. He is the, the more seasoned guy, been there longer, but... Is he a better thrower? Is he more accurate than some of the younger quarterbacks? That is too determined because they don't have much experience just like him. And uh, Isaiah at Michigan, kind of new territory here. We really don't know. Alex Orgy has one completed pass in his career. Um, He seems to be the guy. I don't know. What do you think? That that is also still to be determined. Uh, Michigan still kind of not tipping its hat. I don't know that it knows who the starting quarterback is going to be. I think it's really kind of a two-way race between Alex Orgy and Jack Tuttle. Davis Warren is certainly in that conversation, uh, but Jack Tuttle probably would have been the guy, but he's been limited. He didn't practice at all in the spring, and he's had some soreness still uh, here in the fall, but Alex Orgy is certainly the highest ceiling guy. He's the guy I think that Michigan wants to win because he's kind of in the same vein as Jalen Milrow from Alabama, but Mm kind of has some of the same issues that – accuracy and things of that nature but he spent all off season he knows that accuracy is where you actually win the job and we do know that he has been working very very diligently on that all off season you know another quick point about jack tuttle who's now in his seventh year of course and people say hey he's been playing college football for six years he's never really been a starter is he that good but i'll argue he's been backing up uh top 10 picks in the nfl between michael Penix jr and of course jj mccarthy so uh, maybe there's some there there maybe this is his year Certainly, that's a, that's a line that Michigan's used. That's something that someone that was uh, behind the scenes, one of the the big time staffers there in Ann Arbor, they said that to me right after the spring game, and Trone Moore said it at Big Ten Media Days as well. Uh, he he certainly has a lot of those things that they're looking for. And when you look at it with the, what they have defensively, considering that Michigan tends to want to run the football, uh, they they don't necessarily need a guy that's able to throw it all over the yard. They're looking for someone who can just be consistent, someone who isn't going to turn the ball over, someone that essentially is like Cade McNamara was in 2021. That's what they're looking for. That's what they could get in Tuttle if he's healthy. And, of course, uh, Zach, let's talk about Penn State. You've got the stable quarterback situation here that you know what you're going to get with Drew Aller, at least with the person. The one criticism of Drew Aller is, and maybe the whole offense as a whole, is they didn't chuck it downfield, and I thought he kind of diminished as the season went on, uh, didn't take any chances. Now, I think they 
my opinion is they coached the heck out of him. Of, don't you dare turn the ball over, which he didn't. But I don't think he took enough chances either, and they didn't have much of a vertical game. What do you say about this year with Drew Aller at quarterback for Penn State? You're spot on with that assessment, Craig, that he was coached. You protect the football, rely on your run game, and rely on the defense. Well, you still have a good defense, very good defense with Tom Allen, but Andy Kotelnicki is the X factor here. Mike Yersich, in a lot of ways, was holding back not only Drew Aller, but the offense as a whole. Because if you notice, Penn State didn't really make a lot of changes. They brought in Julian Fleming. They brought in Nolan Rucci. Well, if this offense was so bad, why do they bring in some select players that can at least fill some need, some small needs? They didn't go out and try to get these superstar playmakers, if you will, these superstar difference makers on paper. So I, I think the presence of Andy Kotelnicki will help a lot because it's already instilled confidence with Drew Aller himself. You'll see some of Bo Prabula as well. I think you'll see a lot more of Bo Prabula. There's going to be initi an, an initiative to get a dual-threat quarterback on the football field more often than he was utilized a season ago, and that's what Bo Prabula is going to be, a change-of-pace quarterback, if you will, and that's what Andy Kotelnicki's done. He's used two quarterbacks in his past systems at Buffalo uh, and at Kansas. How does 10 and 2 uh, sit well with, with Penn State fans again this year? I mean, that's that's been the thing. Hey, we got to quit being 10 and 2, which is awesome, by the way, and maybe be 11 and 1 or 12 and 0. But now with the expanded playoffs, there's not a single team in all of college football that can benefit or would have benefited over the last 10 years than Penn State with a 12 team playoff instead of a 14 playoff. And that's very fair to say, too, right? Penn State would have been in more often than not if it was expanded to 12 teams, but that wasn't the case. They missed out. They got very close a couple of other times. To answer your question, 10-2, and two, at least from where I'm sitting, is good enough to get you in the playoff, and it might even be good enough to get you into the Big Ten Championship. It might be good enough to get you a, a matchup where you host in the first round. That doesn't get you a bye, but it gets you an opportunity to potentially host depending on how the deck breaks. So I don't think it's necessary about the record itself is it is Penn State going to make the playoff which I think they do will they host which is what fans want to see and then win that first round and make it to the second round that's going to be a tough matchup depending on who those first four teams are if that's the case but I, I think Penn State fans will be very content if Penn State were to host the playoff game and then win that playoff game at home in Beaver Stadium well, you're not spending seven hundred million dollars on Beaver Stadium for nothing. You want to host a playoff game? There's no doubt about that. Um, let's uh, let's talk some Buckeyes, Jay. I mean, all of you three uh, are kind of the you've been the top three here at the Big Ten: Michigan, Ohio State, Penn State. We have some newcomers. A couple of them are pretty good. Jay, just some. Let's do some round robin. Your quick thoughts from Locked On Buckeyes. Uh, what do you think about the the new additions to the Big Ten and what it means moving forward? It's still weird to have those schools on the West Coast being in a conference that's primarily in the Midwest. I say primarily because there is some Midwest or excuse me, East Coast flavor there, too. Um, I think Oregon and USC, of course, Oregon's the front runner right now. Many people are saying they'll be in the Big Ten championship game or one of those teams that could be there. I agree with that. But I think that all they all bring something different but they boost the level of play in the conference, which is desperately needed. If you got to go out West to get those TV, get the TV dollars, get those eyeballs out there to boost the level of play in your conference. I under, I understand that thought. It's just still weird. It's going to take me a while to get used to those West coast schools in the big 10. Isaiah, your thoughts on the expansion this year. Well, I think it'll be interesting. The last time that there was a team that everyone thought could come in and win the conference right away by addition, it was Nebraska, and it did not go the way that Nebraska fans thought it was going to go. And when you look at stylistically how these teams play compared to what the Big Ten likes to do as a whole, essentially, it something's got to give. And is it going to be these these more big, bulky lines with a stout run game, stout defense, or is it going to be basketball on grass? Uh, and it's, it's interesting when you've got those types of teams that want to be offensive powerhouses, and yet – yeah, there's Ohio State actually over there that has been able to run the Big Ten with having a combination of both. So it'll be interesting to watch these West Coast teams adapt if that is what ends up happening, because it could go the other way. The Big Ten, as we've known it, might have to adapt to them. Uh, Zach, of course, locked on Nittany Lions. You guys have been chasing Michigan and Ohio State. Now you got Oregon. Now you got USC. What are uh, Nittany Lions fans thinking about this expansion? And the expansion is great simply by the the entertainment value because I felt like for the longest time 
is that Penn State schedule, it's just you circle Ohio State, you circle Michigan, and then that's it. You have you have 10 other games that like, okay, you can talk about them, but Penn State's a 20 point favorite, a 30 point favorite. They've won every other game ex- aside from Ohio State and Michigan. I know some mm-hmm. select losses here and there over the past decade of James Franklin's tenure, but I like this a lot. I tend to agree with Isaiah here is how will those former Pac-12 teams adjust? I think that you know, playing against a Minnesota or a Wisconsin in the late October, mid-November game is not going to be fun for a USC. And yes, I know it rains in Washington, but I I just think there is going to be some adaptation here. I think that's the same thing for a Penn State that has to fly out to Southern California in the middle of October. They have never done that. It's different in the NFL when you're conditioned to do that. You're playing all over the country and it's your job. But when you're a student athlete and you got to take a six hour plane ride out to Southern California with no bye week beforehand. You're playing somebody beforehand. I get it. You get a bye week coming back, but that's just an example of how everybody's going to have to adjust in this case. But again, it makes for more. There's so many games you can circle on these respective schedules and say, this is a great weekend for college football in general. For as long as I can remember being a Big Ten fan my entire life, growing up in Michigan, in Indiana, I mean, I didn't even have to look at the Big Ten schedule. I knew that the Buckeyes and Wolverines was the game of the year, bar none. And I always have loved it. I don't think that's the case this year. I think it's October 12th. I think it's Ohio State at Oregon, Autzen Stadium. Jay, I'll start with you. Do you agree with that, or is Michigan still the game? It's still Michigan. I think Oregon poses a threat as far as on paper right now. Ohio State has not beat Michigan since 2019. I don't really want to talk about what could have happened in 2020 because that's we didn't happen. But for the past three years, and Isaiah knows I've been on the show, we've done crossovers, I have been confident going into a couple of those games, and Ohio State's lost them. That's still the biggest game of the year. And I know in the Big Ten, I think it is still going to be the same thing. That Big Ten rivalry, Ohio State-Michigan, Thanksgiving weekend, it's the biggest game of the year. And that's not going to change anytime soon. Uh, Isaiah, I'll let you chime in on that too. So you, you, you disagree that it's not the Oregon Ohio state game is still Michigan. Ohio, Ohio state is the big game of the year. I mean, I, I would say so, but I, I think that making Oregon Ohio state, the, the game of the year, I think that discounts, uh, what some of the other big 10 schools like Michigan or even Penn state, what they present, right. It's, it's kind of the preseason modeling and saying like, okay, this is what these teams are. When it comes to Michigan, Michigan's obviously got a really daunting schedule. Texas week two, USC week four, Washington week six, uh, Oregon uh, three weeks before Ohio State or four weeks before Ohio State to start out in November, and then they got that game. So uh, I, I think, though, like Michigan could go 11-0, and and if it loses to Ohio State, it's going to feel like a failure despite what Michigan's done each of the last three years. So I would still say that that, that game at the end of the schedule – that's still the most important game in the eyes of Michigan fans. Penn State, Zach, uh, how about if you don't win the Big Ten, but you get into that playoff and even win a game? I mean, is that is that an acceptable scenario for you guys this year, or do you, you want to win a Big Ten championship after looking up at Ohio State and Michigan all these years? I mean, it's it's nice. It's a nice idea. But when I ask, you know, fellow Penn State beat reporters, just the conversation is about hosting that playoff game. I don't think it's a matter of how they get to that point. It's just a matter of if Penn State can get to that point. So that means that you can't drop any of those games that, you know, that one that'll sneak in there uh, uh, and Mich- you know, Minnesota circa 2019, right? Those games that kind of sneak up on you where it's like, OK, you're favored, but y- you lose it. Ohio State is the biggest game for Penn State this season because in my mind, I think Ohio State is the Big Ten title winner. I think Ohio State is a national championship contender. I think they will be there with the amount of talent that they you know, could have gone to the NFL and didn't. So that's the case. But Penn State at this point in time is a three and a half point underdog on paper when both teams are fully healthy right now at the beginning of the season. So that's kind of telling how Penn State is close in this situation. I think Ohio State and Oregon are the top two teams in the Big Ten. And then Penn State is that third team on the outside looking in, but they're closer than they are further back. All three of you guys cover teams that made changes at coordinator, uh, especially you at Penn State, Zach. Let's, I mean, offensive coordinator, you mentioned a moment ago, Andy Kolonicki. I think you're going to have a lot more movement and stuff before yes. the snap. Um, and uh, Tom Allen, who I'm familiar with, obviously, as being an Indiana grad, he's now your defensive coordinator. Um, but let's talk about that. What the, the, the movement, all the different formations, all that, uh, from what you've heard from camp so far, 
How is that helping Drew Aller? Is that helping confuse defenses at all? What do you expect? Well, until we see it actually go up against live defenses, we're not going to know for sure how they're going to adjust. But I, just for the sake of logic and reasoning, yes, I think the Big Ten is going to be at least a, in a bit of an adjustment period for what Andy Kotelnicki is going to bring in terms of that. It's about creating movement, deception, communication breakdown where a linebacker's got a point and somebody's going which way, and then the coverage changes. And how can you do all of that with all that pre-snap motion in a matter of milliseconds to change those alignments to fit? So that's what Codal Nikki does is basically break down communication and disorient the defense. What you're going to see from Penn State's offense is maximizing all of its assets. Instead of your traditional, well, Drew Aller's a pro-style quarterback at his core, right? That's true, but he actually lost some weight because they intend to run him more as a dual-threat mm -hmm. quarterback. They're going to involve Bo Prabula as that true dual-threat. So now you got to account for Drew Aller's legs in an instant. You're going to have all that pre-snap movement, as you mentioned. You still have Nicholas Singleton and Catron Allen. Again, if Penn State was really concerned about the, the offense and the weapons that they had, they would have gone out and made these wholesale changes in the transfer portal but they didn't. They got complimentary pieces because they feel good about all of the former five-star and upper four-stars that they have still at their disposal. And Isaiah, Michigan, uh, if I expect any changes on offense. I expect them to run the ball even more with Sharon Moore. I still remember the game against Penn State with 32 straight runs when he was calling the shots, but um, how about defensively with Wink Martindale? It's blitz, blitz, and blitz again. That can be predictable sometimes. What are you hearing? How much are they going to utilize it this year with this football team? Well, he is a more aggressive play caller, but it is essentially the same defense. It's it, keep in mind he was the one he was the one that they were emulating when they brought in Mike McDonald, who was his protege at with the Baltimore Ravens. When Mike McDonald left to go back to the Ravens, they brought in Jesse Minter, who was another one of Mike Martindale's proteges. Yes, he does blitz a lot, but he said like that has been fully game dependent, depending on the teams that have been across from him. So we'll see when it comes. So. When, when it comes to Michigan and its and its coordinators, uh, I, I kind of expect it to look really similar uh, in either way. I don't necessarily think there's going to be a wide deviation from what you've seen the last couple of years. It's kind of like Van Halen, right? They're moving on from David Lee Roth and they're bringing in, <laughs> are they bringing in Sammy Hagar? Are they bringing in Gary Sharon? We're going to find out this year uh, for, for those who are old enough to get that reference, I guess. That's fantastic. I love that. Uh, Chip Kelly, the new offensive coordinator at Ohio State. Um, let me. How does he plan to use Jeremiah Smith? This I keep hearing about this freshman. He's going to blow everybody's doors off. Is he going to play like a lot and work his way into starting lineup and play? He's a day one starter. He's starting right away. It's something that I've heard heard in the spring that he might be a guy that's going to start. Not something you normally hear about a true freshman, but he's different. Even last year during recruiting shows, it's like, oh, Jeremiah Smith mentality is different he's built different and we're seeing that right now in fall camp he's a day one starter but jeremiah smith is going to be a guy going to get a lot of different looks going to be on the outside and i do believe that this offense with chip kelly chip kelly is going to figure out some things with the run game will howard Jutkins, and henderson but he'll also find numerous ways to get jeremiah smith the ball to help him build confidence early in the season all right real quick you all have kind of alluded to this a little bit but let's get it on the record finally before we go uh, the Big Ten Championship game, Jay, will be between, did you say Ohio State and Oregon? You think that's the final? Yeah, I do. All right. Isaiah? I, I can't go against Michigan yet, so I'm going to go with uh, just for the sake of the last three years. So until something changes, I've got Michigan and Oregon. All right. And Zach? I think Ohio State's there. I need to do more due diligence on Oregon, but they are they are up there. It's hard to see the Ducks not being there. But I think any of these four, realistically, again, if the deck breaks favorably for any of Michigan, Penn State, they could make their way into the Big Ten Championship. But I think these are your your top four teams, uh, USC, uh, Washington, Nebraska, all those teams are so far away. These are the core four of the Big Ten this year, but I'll go with Ohio State and Oregon. It's funny you mentioned Washington, Nebraska. We're going to talk about them next, but I want to tell our audience again, uh, Jay Stevens from Locked On Buckeyes, Isaiah Hole from Locked On Wolverines, and Zach Seiko from Locked On Nittany Lions. These guys do a great job. I encourage you to subscribe and follow and listen to them every single day. Appreciate it, gentlemen. Thank you very much. And coming up, we are going to talk about Washington. What to expect out of the Huskies with 20 out of 22 starters being replaced and a new head coach, plus a Nebraska team that's kind of the it team to talk about these days. That's all coming up next on the 2024 Locked On College Football Season Preview Big Ten Edition. 
I want to tell you about Game Time. This is fantastic. You get it on your favorite app, your device. You get tickets to anything, whether it be sporting events, concerts, comedy shows, something local, something out of town. Right there. Get the Game Time app and get tickets right in the palm of your hand. They make it so easy for you to get your tickets and to any event that you can think of. In fact, they've got uh, they've got Game Time picks. Curation makes it easier to save more on sports and the concerts and the comedy that I'm telling you about. They've got all in pricing. My favorite feature is right there. You see a ticket, but before you buy it, you can press and you can see the view, a picture of the view of the seat of the ticket you're about to buy before you go ahead and make your purchase. It is fantastic. Plus, they're offering a Labor Day special, 50% off tickets to the Dodgers and Diamondbacks game on Labor Day that is exclusively on game time. So take the guesswork out of buying any tickets to anything, Big Ten football, baseball, concerts, everything with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use the code Lockdown College for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and the redeem code Lockdown College, L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-C-O-L-L-E-G-E for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last-minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Let me tell you about FanDuel. FanDuel is awesome. We love watching sports, right? It's exciting. But it's even more exciting with FanDuel. You got a little something on it? FanDuel is where you need to be. FanDuel is America's number one sports book. We'll have something a little different for you right here. I want to tell you about now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. You're not going to beat that. And then of course, you know, you got the YouTube TV base plan. You'll be able to watch every regular season, Sunday afternoon, out of market game. All you need is a Google account and a current form of payment, and you can cancel anytime, but why would you? This is awesome. Just visit fanduel.com slash locked on. That's fanduel.com slash locked on to download America's number one sports book. Back at the 2024 Locked On College Football Season Preview, Big Ten Edition. All right, we're playing musical chairs here. We've got 18 teams in the Big Ten. We got a lot of people to talk to. Uh, Roman Tomashoff from Locked On Huskies is with us, and Connor Happer from Locked On Nebraska. Um, you know, I was I was worried we're going to have this. I'm already mad that we put it together this way because I'm going to say Huskies and Huskers. I'm going to get it screwed up at some point. But gentlemen, <laughs> welcome. It's good to talk to you. Uh, let's start off with the Locked On Huskies since you're new to the group, right? Uh, that would be, be rude for us to not start with you first. So welcome to the Big Ten. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and, um, you know, you are one of four new teams here with the Big Ten. Um, I think you're the biggest mystery team in the Big Ten this season. With 20 out of 22 starters replaced, a new coach. I, I Here's my vibe on Washington. Um, I, I think you're going to be good. I don't have a whole lot to back that up with. I just think there were some guys, next man up kind of deal. I still think you have size and experience and all that. But other than that, I really don't. And I've said this on my podcast because I do a pretty deep dive preview on all my all the teams. I don't know what to expect out of you guys. What do you expect? Yeah, Craig, you did a really great job with them. That was a fantastic listen. And I it's it's tough. I'm I'm there every day and I still don't necessarily have a he, like a great read on what everything's going to look like. Here's what I can tell you. The defense is going to be legit. This is a really, really fun defense led by Steve Belichick, where, you know, having just his dad on campus has been a crazy thing for me personally as a Patriots fan, but having his dad on campus has just all of that. The way that's all gone is just this defense is looks very well coached and it's going to be very well coached on the field. That part is, you know, it, it, the guys are going to vary. There's going to be a whole lot of rotation, not at linebacker. The linebackers look really good, or it's going to be Carson Bruner, who I think is going to be one of the better guys in the big 10, but offensively is where I have all the questions. As you said, Craig, this team was number two in the country last season. Now, all of a sudden, they're out on the outside of the top 25, looking in, replacing all 11 starters, replacing an offensive-minded head coach in Kalen DeBoer, a fantastic offensive coordinator in Ryan Grubb. And they made the best possible replacement, getting Jed Fish, getting that staff in here. But there are so many questions. What's Will Rogers going to look like? What's the Joe Moore Award winning offensive line going to look like now that there are five new starters up there? It's it's really curious, and there there's going to be so so many interesting things to watch for this season. I'm very excited about it, and I'm going to get your take on the other three teams too. You can kind of represent them here for this segment. We'll get back to that in a minute. 
I want to talk to Connor here from Locked On Nebraska. And Connor, um, I have three teams I'm circling. I, I won't call them next tier teams, but three teams. And since they're not here today, I will uh, talk about um, Rutgers, number one. I think Vegas had them at five and a half wins. They bumped it to six and a half. That's a seven win team with everybody back, and they do have a new quarterback. I think they're. I think they're gonna. I take the over on the win total there. Um, again, Iowa was the car wreck on the side of the road that you couldn't take your eyes off last year. How low could they go in points and still win football games? They end up winning ten games and getting to the Big Ten championship. I think, you know, with Kay McNamara coming back, I think more the same. I don't think they're going to have an explosive offense at, at all. I don't think they got any receivers. I think Tim Lester is going to be uh, like Kirk Ferentz's son, Brian, again on offense. I could be wrong. And they're going to be spectacular on defense. And they have a favorable schedule. They're going to win a lot of football games this year. And my other it team this year is the Nebraska Cornhuskers. I, the excitement is palpable down there. What do you think? Yeah, the the three teams that you just mentioned there have schedules that really line up. I mean, for Nebraska, their their first seven games are all winnable, and then after that, you know, once the calendar hits late October and in November, you know, it's Ohio State, it's UCLA, it's USC, it's Wisconsin, and it's Iowa. So they got to they got to win some games in September and October, including a, a key one early with Colorado that'll kind of set the tone and the mood um, on September seventh. That's the second week of the season, but. No doubt about it. There's plenty of excitement. I, I think, um, you know, they won five games last year with a really, truly putrid offense. It was the worst offense at Nebraska that I had ever seen. Um, and that most at Nebraska had ever seen it statistically it was the worst offense at Nebraska since the sixties. So um, they're not going to turn the ball over 31 times this year. <laughs> they're going to have a new freshman quarterback, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Um, and so things, things are definitely looking up. It's just how far could it go? It's a really blank canvas to see how, high the offense can take Nebraska this year because their defense is going to be uh, just as salty as it was, if not more so than it was a year ago. You know, I, I watched that team last year and I thought, all right, Matt rule comes in and his first year, I thought, I thought he ran a very outdated offense where it was like, it's option football, but your quarterback was going to be your first option. It was like Tom Osborne. And now they got this Dylan Rayola. That's not what he is. He's he's like the real deal, this freshman quarterback. Um, I watched him in the spring game. I was blown away. Uh, you know, I, I'd, I'd be willing to tap the brakes and say, look, true freshmen don't just step into power four schools and start on day one. But I think that's exactly what's shaping up. I, I, you know, I see guys like Joel Klatt saying this is the next Patrick Mahomes. I don't know if that's a little lofty, but still. I like what I see so far. This guy's the real deal. Yeah, he's, I mean, he's got the look. I mean, the comparisons to Mahomes are obvious just because he looks like him. You know, he wears number 15. He's kind of his protege. I mean, they hang out in the offseason. They train with the same quarterback's coach. So um, that's, that's, that makes a lot of sense why they've been, you know, kind of drawn as, as corollaries. But I mean, he, he's got the stuff to back it up too. He's got a great arm. I mean, he's, the day he stepped on campus, he was better than any of the three guys that Nebraska played last year. Nebraska was trying to, I mean, they, they started off with Jeff Sims. He was transferred from Georgia Tech, high turnover guy. They were thinking, man, maybe we could have the run game. Maybe we could do enough around him to, to keep him out of trouble. They weren't. His turnover situation got worse. He got hurt. Then they turned it over to Heinrich Harburg last year, who's going to be their backup this year. Like you said, they were kind of just an option team. Every once in a while, they'd throw it deep. Um, their their options were really limited. So. Nebraska's, you know, coordinators, their co-coordinators this year, they added a, a co-coordinator in the offseason. Um, they're they're really licking their chops. I think they're ready to prove some people wrong. Um, you know, to your point about what they were doing on offense last year. I think they're excited to show people how dynamic they can be with a quarterback who they know can make plays. They revamp the wide receiver room at the top. Um, and they think they could be pretty good in the run game as well. So I think they're really excited to see to show people how dynamic they could be. You know, uh, Roman, let's talk about Will Rogers because I think that's the one thing we kind of know about of the 20 guys we're replacing or whatever, right? He's going to be quarterback coming out of the, uh, you know, the old Mike Leach system. Uh, he should be able to throw the ball pretty well, right? We're, we're pretty comfortable with how that's going to go, right? Yeah, I, I feel fully confident Will Rogers. Obviously, you know, replacing Michael Penix is, is an impossible task, which I, I don't wish upon anybody. But the fact that it's Will Rogers seems like, like I said with Jed Fish, is the best possible outcome here where you're getting a guy who has so much experience in the sec coming over has one year where he's going to be learning a very different style system in Jed fish's pro style offense, but 
he has a really good cast of receivers around him. Denzel Boston's a guy who didn't get a lot of run last year where, I mean, you know, call me crazy, but getting getting the chance to break into the lineup when Roma Dunze, Jalen Polk, and Jalen McMillan are ahead of you seems kind of tough. I don't know. I, I feel like I'm going on a limb there a little bit. But he's got a really nice cast of guys around him, and Will has shown that he's going to protect the ball. He's going to make high percentage throws, and with the guys that he has around him, I feel fully confident in his ability to lead this offense for one season before handing the reins over to Demond Williams, who's a true freshman that Jed Fish brought with him from Arizona to Washington, who is really impressed with his legs and his arm talent, but certainly looks like he just needs a little bit of time to adapt to the college game. All right, I'm going to put you in a difficult spot here since we don't have Spencer with us here. I'm going to have you talk about Oregon for just a second because you know him pretty <laughs> well, uh, being one of your uh, arch rivals. They seem loaded for bear this year. It's unbelievable, the talent acquisition. They're like the Ohio State of the West Coast, I think. Uh, I'm not going to say anything that nice about them. I, I, I can't <laughs> go that far. But yeah, no, they're, they, they're certainly a very talented team. And just the way that offense is shaping up with Tez Johnson, with Evan Stewart, Dylan Gabriel, it's it's certainly going to be very interesting to watch. What I'm, I'm most curious about is what that defensive line is going to look like. Because Dan Lanning for the last couple of years now has been loading up there, whether it be through the transfer portal, through high school recruiting, and he's got a lot of really talented bodies up front. And that just seems to be, you know, obviously, as as everyone has said about the Big Ten for so long, now it's weird talking about it from an inside perspective. It, this is This is still foreign to me. But the more I look at it, the more it's, yeah, you need to make sure you dominate in the front seven. And they have all the pieces to do that, which is, I, I think, what gonna be, it's, is going to be their biggest strength this season. Are, um, is there any sentiment, uh, sentimental uh, feelings from you guys representing the four uh, Pac-12 teams, the, the Pac-12, the demise of the Pac-12? Or are you just gung-ho excited? Hey, let's let's join the Big Ten and let's go. It's a little bit of both. RIP Pac-12, first and foremost. We we, we loved our time in, in the Pac-12, as, as anybody did who grew up out here on the West Coast watching college football. I've, everybody loved the Pac-10, Pac-12 era. And there, there are a lot of good things about it. But at the same point, for any fan who has reservation, for the salty Oregon State and Washington State fans, it was either you make the move and you adapt to the new world of college football or you fade into irrelevance. Those yeah. were really the only two outcomes here. And the fact that Washington has the opportunity to jump into a premier conference like the Big Ten is so fun and so exciting. And just some of the ways we've already seen them marketed by the Big Ten network is something the Pac-12 was never doing, where the Pac-12 network had some great crews like with Yogi Roth and all those guys. But the Big Ten network is already such a big step up. And obviously with the media rights and everything else that's going on, that the big 10 is bringing to the table makes it really, really exciting to think about the future. Connor, I want to ask you one more question about Nebraska. Then we'll kind of get you guys predictions on how things will go. Um, the first game against UTEP, presumably it'll be Dylan Rillo's first game. Um, you know, I know that they don't want to do any turnovers like last year, but he is a rookie, a freshman quarterback. Um, it's a good game to get his feet wet. And then I am really looking forward to that next game against Colorado with Coach Prime and Shadur Sanders. By the way, it's going to be a great day. You got Michigan and Texas in that day. You got uh, Colorado taking on Nebraska. That's the game that's going to really tell Nebraska, I think, which way they go. Do you agree? Yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, this season sort of sets up. I mean, last time Nebraska went to a bowl game, it was in 2016. Unbelievably, I know it's weird to hear, but 2016. Um, they started 7-0 and that year, and early in the season, in September, they had a premier non-conference home game with Oregon. Oregon wasn't great that year, um, but Nebraska edged them out. They beat them, and they kind of did the same thing all the way throughout the rest of September and through October, starting 7-0 and before they went to Madison and lost in overtime against Wisconsin that year. But that team won nine games, um, and, and they went to a bowl game, and, and their hot start kind of propelled them. So like, I, I think it sets up kind of the same this year for Nebraska here in, in 2024, you get past that. And then you feel like, man, there is some winnable, not that, not that there's not tests in between. Um, there's plenty of them, but Nebraska would feel good about itself. And it would be a giant burden off the backs of the program. I mean, Nebraska yeah. fans are going to want that really bad. It's a night game. Um, since they restarted this home and home here, Nebraska hasn't beat them. They're over three. Um, and so it's been a long time since they beat one of their biggest rivals. So there's a lot hanging on it. Um, it's a really important game, and it's and it's a big game for the program, too. All right, Connor, who are the two teams playing in the Big Ten Championship, and who wins the thing? 
Yeah, I've been, I, I'll stay. I'll stick to status quo here. I think most people are going to take Ohio State and Oregon. I'll take Ohio State and Oregon as well. I think Ohio State is, you know, a national championship favorite type of team. My question for them would be the quarterback position. Um, you know, is is Will Howard going to take you to the next level? We've seen yeah. Ohio State quarterbacks who could do that. Um, and we know that we know that Dylan Gabriel is pretty dang good. So I think both those teams, physically top to bottom on their roster, are just pretty much head and shoulders better than anybody else in the conference. And I expect it to end up that way. Roman, what are your picks? Uh, so I, I certainly got to put Ohio State in there, but because of this flag behind me, I'm going to go away from the Oregon pick right there. You know, we, we haven't seen them get over the hump in in any way, shape, or form throughout their their entire college football existence. So give me Penn State. I really want to see Drew Aller take a step forward at quarterback. I really love what they're doing defensively. And if they can just get a few pieces right offensively, I feel like this is the year that Penn State really can get over the hump, as you guys talked about a little bit earlier. And I'd, I'd really like to see that from just a bunch of the guys they have all over that roster. Roma Tomashoff from Locked On Huskies, Connor Happer from Locked On Nebraska. They do a great job. If you don't already, subscribe, check them out, listen every day with their Locked On podcast. And we're going to talk to a couple other hosts from some other Big Ten schools and get their thoughts on how things are shaping up in just a minute as we put 2024 into focus a little bit. Very excited about the start of the season. And we'll tell you who wins the conference according to them. Me, I'll give you my final picks as well. The 2024 Lockdown College Football Season Preview continues the Big Ten edition. Ibotta, if you're like me, you spend a lot of money. I have a family. I spend money every day. I don't want to. I just do. There's a lot of stuff you have to buy. Summertime, sandals, sunscreen, snacks for the kids, running people around, gas, everything. Ibotta can make that a lot better, a lot easier, and save you some money. You can get cash back on all your purchases so you can spend more time making memories this summer and less time dreaming about them. It is summertime. Pretty soon it's going to be fall. A whole new set of expenses come with fall, right? But we can still get the barbecue out there, stock up on your favorite grilling favorites, your football favorite snacks, all that stuff with Ibotta. Ibotta is a free app. And it lets you earn cash back every time you shop. You can earn hundreds of items from groceries to beauty supplies, toys. You can make sure that you're beating inflation. Inflation is a problem, right? You can beat it with Ibotta. The average Ibotta user earns $256 a year. Right now, Ibotta is offering our listeners $5 just for trying Ibotta by using the code Lockdown College when you register. So go to the App Store or Google Play Store and download the free Ibotta app to start earning cash back and use the code LOCKEDONCOLLEGE. That's Ibotta, I-B-O-T-T-A, in the Google Play or App Store and use the code LOCKEDONCOLLEGE. All right, we continue. I'm having a blast here. Our 2024 Locked On College Football Season Preview, our Big Ten edition here, and joining us now is Jacob Goins from Locked On Hoosiers and Matt Sheehan from Locked On Spartans. Very excited to have you guys on. Let's get right into it. Uh, but first, I want to tell our audience, check these guys out. They do great work every day. Subscribe to Locked Thanks. On Hoosiers and Locked On Spartans, please, uh, on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. All right. Uh, Matt, hang on just a second. You know, I'm an Indiana grad. I, I'm first question is going to Jacob. All right. Yes. Yeah. I'm just going to leave, actually. You guys have fun. This has been, this has been good. All right. <laughs> I'm a little older than you guys. I've been waiting a long time for the Hoosiers to make it to the Rose Bowl week three at UCLA. That counts. I'm just going to pretend it's January 1st, Jacob. What do you think? Yeah, I'm here for it. We're going to count it on Locked on Hoosiers, so you may as well start to count it everywhere else. And excited for the game. I don't know how it's going to go, but yeah, it, it counts in my book, so let's let's rock with it. All right. Well, and UCLA, let's talk about them just a little bit. Just a quick preview. Um you know, they had that rough start of that press conference on uh, Big Ten Media Days, and I was like, uh-oh, we're in trouble here. And they lost their defensive coordinator to, to USC, so I really don't know what to expect out of UCLA. I think they might be down kind of toward the bottom this year. I think it's a, I think it's a winnable road game for the Hoosiers. I do too. And that's sort of what I've been telling my my listeners and my watchers, my everydayers over at Locked on Hoosiers is, look, this is early in the season, but it's not as daunting as it looks. You know, you see an early road game in the Big Ten, you got to go all the way out west and it's like, ah, great, here we go. But 
this isn't the UCLA of, of old. There's no crazy offense out there. They're not just going to light up the scoreboard. And, and I think Indiana's talent-wise on both sides of the ball, especially on defense, is what's going to help them in games this year. And so some people will look at it who don't know the Big Ten or don't know Indiana or UCLA and go, oh, psh, UCLA, they got it in the bag. But don't overlook the Hoosiers in week three at UCLA. It is a winnable game. And if they do, then the season could go in a much different direction than most people think. And I think the more formidable team out there, obviously, is USC. They took Danton Lynn, the defensive coordinator from UCLA. And by the way, UCLA was a very good, very good and underrated defense last year. Now the guy that was in charge of it is running the Trojans defense. Lincoln Riley's teams have never even spelled the word defense, let alone played it. They, they have to coming into the Big Ten, and we'll see how Miller Moss is if that six-touchdown performance in the Holiday Bowl was an aberration or if it was the real deal. But I think the Trojans could be pretty good. I think they're on the bubble, the mix, competing with uh, some of the other, other epilo- upper echelon teams trying to get uh, into the playoffs from the Big Ten. Matt, let's talk to you because both of you sure. guys, we could talk about this, both of you guys have new head coaches this year. Jonathan Smith, what's your impression so far? Love it. We know there's going to be a little bit of a long road ahead, but this guy has already rebuilt Oregon State, and that was in much more dire straits than the situation over here in East Lansing. For a few reasons, you know, resources, just the history of Michigan State, where it is just, you know, physically on a map in the Midwest. Not a bad spot to be if you're a football coach, but what we do like is that he came over with a few guys, whether it's, you know, guys in his offensive staff, guys like Brian Lindgren, or, hey, how about the players that are actually going to be on the field, like Aiden Childs, Tanner Miller, a great interior offensive lineman, and you can watch four snaps of Michigan State football last year. You would know that we need interior linemen. So the second team All-American transferring over, that's going to help as well as Jack Valley to tight end who caught more tight end touchdowns than anyone else in the nation last year. So look, just entering the, the door with those guys, that's an okay start right now. All right. Speaking of last year, I got to ask. I mean, what a year. I mean, the Mel Tucker thing aside, I'm not even going to bring that what up. What happened? Why? Well, did something happen, Craig? Well, <laughs> so, yeah. Oh. Uh-huh. And it, just put that aside. It was a crazy year. Can we go back Horrible. to game? Can we go back to game one? Have you gotten an official explanation <laughs> as to why Connor Stallions was on the the Central Michigan sideline at your stadium? Somebody uh, had to issue him a press pass. Of co- of course, we don't have an explanation now. CMU they did fire their quarterbacks coach about a week or two ago. Hmm. Oh, yeah. that's weird. He was on Jim Harbaugh's staff two or three years ago and might have some connections there. Isn't that kind of odd? Oh, wait, he also signed an extension back in January. So it kind of connect the dots there that, well, maybe some people knew each other, never deleted each other's numbers off each other's phones. And that's how the connections were made there. But no, our athletic director back in July, he gave an interview with Graham Couch with Lansing State Journal. And he said, CMU hasn't even offered like an apology or an explanation or anything. So their stance is we're going to wait for the NCAA investigation to wrap up before we do anything. And <laughs> my question is why? Just, just do it. Like you guys are big boys. You can make your own decisions. So uh, no, we don't have any answers on that. So it's okay. well, the NCAA might take another couple of years with it. I mean, they just closed up Burger Gate. So Spygate, okay. that'll be like 2028. Unless, that quick. unless well. net, the Netflix special on August 27th, the Spygate special come out. Maybe we'll get some answers there. What do you true, think? true. Yeah, tell me all about it. I'll be the last person to watch that one. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I can't wait to see what uh, everyone else has to say about it. Respectfully. Right. Jacob, locked on Hoosiers. You have a new football coach too, Kurt Signetti. Um, he seems to be a different guy, kind of goes to the beat of his own drum. It's almost like he's going to do things his way, but there's a little bit of a comedy show in the way he phrases his words. He's uh, amusing at the same time. He's just a different guy. I love it, though. I absolutely love it because he has the – and I dropped this on the show a few weeks ago, and I figured – I thought it was going to go more viral than it did, and I'm glad that it didn't. It's very Nick Saban-esque, and what I mean by that is he runs his own ship. As you said, Craig, he does it his way. He's been a coach long enough, and he's turned around enough programs to where I think he's earned that respect to come in and say, this is what I want, this is how we're going to do it, buy in or get out. And you saw a lot of transfers leave. You saw a lot of his guys come from James Madison, players and coaches. And you've seen that expand outside the locker room from donors to the athletic department, to the fan base. Like the excitement is there and the buy-in is there and the support is there, which is something, Craig, you know this, it just hasn't always been like that. And I think it took somebody like Kurt Signetti to come in and say, look, 
this has not been acceptable. I'm going to change it. And whether it works out or not, we'll find out in a few years. But he came in and and laid down the law. And so far, it seems to be working. This is some of the most talent we've seen in a long time on both sides of the football. And I think it's going to pay dividends when you see him on the field this fall. Every time I look at the depth chart of the Hoosiers, it's all in orange because it's all the marks the transfers. I think you got eight yep. transfers on offense and seven on defense. Basically, it's it's James Madison has come to Bloomington. I just I'm curious, are they gonna look like kind of, I don't know, Mac level or Big Ten? How how do you think these James Madison players are gonna do together as a unit? You know, that's a legitimate concern. And you see this just about every time you see a coach go from one program to the other, right? It's okay. Are they going to look like the old team that they came from? And and while there may be a little bit of that, I do think they've gotten better. I think they've raised their level of play. And the few guys that did hang around from Indiana a year ago, plus you bring in a transfer quarterback who's played college football for about 18 years, all of that combined – I think this team's going to be much improved. How many points will they score? I don't know. How many points will they allow? I don't know. But I do think you will see them as the season goes on. They will play Big Ten style football and at least be able to compete in Big Ten football. But hey, maybe the UCLA game is an eye opener. Maybe it's one of those early few games as well where it's like, whoa, okay, maybe we're not physically, mentally, emotionally ready for this, but it won't take long for Kurt Signetti to figure it out. Matt, how long of a rebuild turnaround is this? Is this a slow and steady uh, turtle race, or is it more like the hare, the rabbit? Are we going to see a quick turnaround? What do you think? You know, in this day and age, two or three years does seem like a long time, but yeah, just based on everything that we know about Jonathan Smith and what he did over at Oregon State. And also, there's a really nice in-depth piece over at Spartans Illustrated. A lot of players got to speak in an anonymous condition, staff members too. It, the constant theme was not only is he rebuilding the culture, but he does not take any shortcuts, doesn't cut any corners. Like he knows that it's a process. He will do it his way. So two years. Okay. That's when Aiden Childs is now a junior. Maybe, you know, you get things turning over a little earlier than you would like. Maybe he even sticks around for his senior year and year three, but I think it'll be three years is my guess. Wouldn't be shocked if, you know, we're flirting with nine wins in year two, but yeah, I don't think it's going to be an instant success. Now, with that said, I'll, I'll take seven and five this year, and you best believe I will have a parade down Grand River Avenue. It'll be the hardest anyone has ever celebrated a Jacksonville Tax Slayer Bowl birth ever. But, like, look, seven and five would mean you're ahead of schedule. And I think with Michigan State's schedule, it's in play. It, it, it's in play. Four and a half over under be damned. I think seven and five is in play. I, I, I want to laugh at you for a parade for seven and five, but we Hoosiers, that, yeah, okay. That I haven't seen the bowl game in three years here. So, yeah, yeah. I, I can yeah. do anything. I just want to feel something after the month of December flips on the calendar. Yeah. Like, that's yeah, something that asks me a lot. Down, down, going down Kirkwood yep. Avenue if we get seven and five. That would be you awesome. You better believe it. All right, guys, Um, as we look up at the other teams in the Big Ten, I said earlier sure. on this podcast, for the first time in my life, I don't think Michigan-Ohio State is the game. I think it's Oregon uh, hosting Ohio State on October 12th. Uh, some mixed reaction to that. But who do you guys think are going to be in the Big Ten Championship now that we get rid of the, 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 the West Division? It's the two best teams. Who's in it? Matt, I'll start with you. Maryland and UCLA. No, I'm kidding. I, I just, it's just, I hate to be this boring. I, it's Oregon and Ohio State. I, both those guys have spent more than half the AFC in the offseason. It, 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 it's going to be them too. I'll stop the conversation. All right. All right. All right. Jacob, how about you? I mean, I, I I want to go off the beaten path so bad. I want to say, oh, you know, it's going to be Michigan. They're going to surprise people and still be good this year. Or maybe it's, you know, Maryland that does actually decide to just light up the scoreboard. But I can't. I can't do it, Craig. I cannot do it. So we're going to be wrong, so just be ready for it. We will be wrong when the Big Ten Championship game rolls yeah. around. It'll be Purdue that shocks everybody <laughs> and, and makes a run. But my official pick will be the Buckeyes from Ohio State, who I think are the most talented team in college football. And then it's going to be Oregon, too, who's going to be right there behind them. They'll be two of the highest seeds in the college football playoff, but they will play each other for the Big Ten Championship. Jacob Goins, Locked on Hoosiers. Matt Sheehan, Locked on Spartans. If you haven't already, subscribe and listen to them every day. They do a great job. Subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. Gentlemen, thank you very much. And for everybody out there, follow and subscribe your favorite Big Ten team, no matter who it is. We'll be covering your favorite team every day throughout the season. And don't forget, I'll have you covered on the entire conference 
every day, all 18 teams on Locked On Big Ten, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.